Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Empowered Podcast. My name is Austin Alvarez, and I'm here with Aaron Jerger and our very special guest, Amy Work, who is a licensed counselor and registered play therapist. So how's it going, everybody? Great. Yeah, Fantastic. good. Happy to be here. Awesome. Yeah, thanks for jumping on, Amy. So uh, what, what are we talking about today, Aaron? Well, I think we should get to know Amy a little bit um, before we dive in for our listeners. So Amy, can you tell us how you came to this counseling and play therapy and what your path was to get here? Sure. Yeah. Well, I've known since I was little, I either wanted to be a teacher or a counselor um, and wasn't really sure which one. I'd always had an interest in both, particularly just because I've had you know, family members face mental health issues. Um, and so had always been aware of that, but I initially decided to go into teaching and I taught high school math for four years and loved it. But I did find that more than the actual teaching, my favorite part was building relationships with my students. Um, and oftentimes they would then come and disclose things to me. Like, you know, um, I can remember one in particular um, shared with me that she was being abused by a family member and um, or, you know, other students sharing um, that they were struggling with depression or anxiety and things like that. And, uh, um, you know, at that point as a teacher, you have to hand them off to a guidance counselor. But I wanted to be the one that was walking with them through those things. And so um, after four years, I decided to step away from teaching and pursue um, education and becoming a therapist. So that's how I kind of ended up where I am. That's an amazing journey. And we need more teachers and counselors like that. So thank you for that. Couldn't agree more. And I appreciate you sharing that, Amy. So so let's dive into our topic then, emotional health. So Amy, what's the first step to becoming emotionally healthy? Yeah, so there's many things that we can do to become emotionally healthy, but I would say that the base step, the very initial first thing is simply becoming aware of our emotions our emotions and our thoughts influence our behaviors. And so often it's subconscious, we don't think about it. We just go through our day. Um, we might be aware of, you know, maybe three emotions, happy, sad, and mad, but there's actually so much more than that. And there's, there's so much more of that that's influencing our day to day. So the first step is even just becoming aware of what we're feeling and why we're feeling it. And how, how does someone do that? Are there activities? Like, how do you do this with your clients? Yeah. So, uh, um, you know, a couple of things, you know, first, like, it's so interesting when I start out with a client, they'll come in, you know, day one and I'll ask like, how are you feeling? And they'll say, I'm good. I'm like, well, good isn't really an emotion actually. <laughs> um, or they'll, you know, if you ask them for an emotion, that really is only their range is like good, happy, sad, mad, those sorts of things. And so I actually, um, I have an emotions wheel that I love to use. Um, and if you're watching the video of this, I'm going to share my screen. Um, Ooh, if you're listening, visuals. I'm sure they'll share it in the show notes, but, or you can even just Google emotion color wheel. Um, and so what we're looking at right now is just a wheel with um, different layers of emotions. And there's probably, I haven't counted, but I would say maybe there's, you know, 80 emotions or something listed here. Um, and so I'll have clients start by looking at this and taking some time to just sit silently, looking at it, scanning and reading the different, the different emotions um, and picking out at least five that they either feel currently or that they have felt recently. And then we sit with each one and, you know, I say like, okay, what has influenced you to feel, you know, I'll just read some out, um, to feel hurt this week, or what are some of the things that have influenced you to feel hopeful or bored or depressed or any of those different things. Um, and it kind of, you know, I would say over the first few sessions, they really need the color wheel to look at and read these things off. But after a while, their emotional vocabulary expands a lot and people are able to just like have the words to say how they're feeling. That's amazing. This so is great. So it looks like what I'm seeing in the center is major categories, right? So you're starting with peaceful, sad, mad, scared, joyful, powerful, and then it looks like it branches out from those. So for instance, scared will branch out to confused, rejected, helpless, submissive, insecure, anxious. And then so if I came and said, hey, I'm, I'm feeling, I wouldn't have called it scared, but now I'm looking down to anxious and overwhelmed. And maybe because of my situation right now, I am feeling overwhelmed. I guess that is anxiety. I wouldn't, maybe I wouldn't have called it that and definitely wouldn't have called it being scared. 
And then what do you tell them? Where do you go from there? Yeah, so, uh, um, well, two things. First, I would say sometimes there's, well, not sometimes, I would say all the time, there's this emotional release that comes when you're able to put a name to what you're feeling. Um, the stress relief that comes from that. And then first of all, being able to name it. And then second of all, well, we actually say name it to tame it. Um, it's kind of like a little phrase that I use with my kids and my adults. But um, once you, so naming it is helpful in and of itself, but then two, naming it in the presence of someone else. So having your counselor being able to witness you discussing how you're actually feeling, validating those feelings and seeing you feel that way um, and kind of holding a safe space for you to explore that emotion. That in and of itself is, is healing. Um, a lot of us don't really have spaces like that in our day-to-day -day lives to be able to sit and explore those feelings and just be with somebody. Oftentimes, you know, we might not have a safe space or the person that we share them with jumps in with a solution. It's like, I don't, I don't want to hear the solution. Maybe even I know the solution, but I just want someone to witness me feeling this way. Um, and that in and of itself can be healing. I can see this being great for kids. I mean, it's for adults too. Yeah. Um, I'm going to be printing this out. <laughs> and, um, you know, I think that is it helpful to have for parents to have something like this for, for their yeah. kids to talk to them? Yeah, I actually have a kid's version as well. Um, and I can pull that up in a little bit. But yeah, I have a kid's version as well that has fewer, you know, names. Mm -hmm. in it. I would use this for maybe 12 and up. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's and then great. I have, have one for kids that has less words and some more like pictures of faces and things mm -hmm. like that. Um, but yeah. And so a lot of times with kids, this is actually a fun activity I do with them, um, that I definitely would recommend parents doing is I'll draw a big heart on a piece of paper and I'll say, Hey, I want you to pick, you know, four different feelings that you, that you think you're feeling by looking at the list, you know, pick four of them and pick a color that matches each feeling and you can pick whatever color you want. And then color in the heart to show how much of that feeling you're feeling. So mm -hmm. if you're, let's say you pick sad and you only feel a little bit sad, then you might color in a small amount. But if you're feeling really sad, you might color in a lot. Um, and so then you have this visual because when you can make things concrete for kids and not abstract, it really helps them understand it better. So you have this visual that you can reference. Um, and it also helps our kids understand that sometimes you feel more than one emotion at once. Sometimes you're not only sad, sometimes you're sad and angry and a little bit scared. Um, or sometimes with grief, sometimes you're happy and sad. You're sad because you've lost the person or the thing, but you're happy because you have these memories. Um, and so it can kind of help, you know, kids understand their own emotions and have a jumping off talking point um, for kids and parents to engage. That's great. So question, um, you know, we're still in the middle of the pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic, and I'm sure that's dramatically affected everybody's mental health. So what are you seeing more of um, in the in the latter stages, hopefully of this pandemic from a even from the wheel standpoint, what emotions, what are we what are you addressing more so than not? How's that going? that's like a whole can of worms. I feel like we could do a whole episode on just that, but, um, and I think it depends on the, on the ages. I would say with kids, what we've really noticed is an uptick in anxiety, um, specifically social anxiety. So the way that anxiety is really kept, um, you know, low and not like super high and creating all these issues is that, uh, we're, faced with doing these things every day. And when we're, when we do certain things every day, our brain learns, oh, I can do this and it's not scary and I'm fine. So, but for kids who, when they don't go to school every single day, or when they're not around friends every single day, or they're not in social situations every single day, their brain gets out of that practice. And so then when it's time to re-engage in those things, it feels extremely scary to the brain because we haven't done that in a long time. And I haven't been practicing those skills in a long time. And so we're seeing a lot of social anxiety and just anxiety in general too um, mm -hmm. with kids. With adults, I would say um, one of the issues is loneliness, especially individuals who um, are not married or don't have a partner that they're living with or don't have a roommate. Um, 
because if they're working completely virtually and then staying at home, they're not truly spending time with people or sharing their lives with people. There aren't chats in the lunchroom. There's not, you know, conversations at the water cooler. There's not work events, happy hours, things like that. And so they're home by themselves and even like not engaging in any physical touch at all. No handshakes, no hugs, no high fives. And that that's just hard for anyone. We were created to, to have a community um, to have physical touch. And so those are really two of, you know, much more that we're seeing. Like I said, I could talk about that for a long time. That's very eye-opening. And, you know, for someone experiencing those either loneliness or for kids, do you use play therapy for those situations? And, and how do you incorporate that? Yeah, great question. So um, with kids, I do use play therapy um, primarily if they're three to 12, just because research shows that that's the best treatment for individuals in that age group. Um, and so, you know, the reason for that is that kids, often their emotional development outpaces their verbal development. And so, you know, a five-year-old uh, isn't going to be able to, you know, tell me verbally how they might feel. Like if I ask them, how are you feeling? They're going to be like, I'm good. I'm happy. Right. Um, but they may be able to play out how they feel. So um, I can give you an example of this. Um, I was working the other day with a little girl who um, she has a very tense relationship uh, with her dad, her parents are going through a separation right now. And actually that in and of itself is, an, is, you know, connected to the pandemic. We're seeing a lot higher rates of divorce. We're also seeing a lot higher rates of family tension because we're with each other constantly all the time. There's not these breaks of going to work or going to school. Um, and so, you know, divorce lawyers are seeing a lot more clients as well as counselors right now. Um, but, you know, anyway, so I have a, this was this five-year-old who was working, who I was working with. And I, I have a specially dedicated play therapy space with certain toys. And um, she was, you know, creating, I have this big sand tray and I have all these little miniature items that they can put in the sand tray to create scenes or, you know, use that to discuss emotions. And she was creating um, a scene of a house and she had these different rooms she had made in the sand tray. And then she had these different people characters that she pulled in and she was telling me about them. And she said, this is my mom. This is me. This is my sister. And this is a dad. And I said, oh, that's a dad. And she said, yeah. And I said, it's not your dad. She said, no, this is a nice dad. This dad plays with me. And so, you know, we were able to explore that and talk about that, but that was her way of saying to me, like, if let's say that she was, you know, 16 or 17, she might've sat on my couch and say, my dad never hangs out with me and it really hurts my feelings. I don't really think he likes me, but a five-year-old is not going to say that they're going to play it out instead. And so that's kind of what play therapy looks like, um, compared to, you know, traditional talk therapy or therapy we might do with adults. Now, practically, would that look like, so if you're helping walk a, a child through, somebody 3 to 12, through kind of reintegrating into school, um, mm -hmm. it's not it's not um, remote schooling, um, maybe, are, are you saying that they would potentially like draw themselves, okay, draw your classroom, draw yourself in the classroom, and, you know, I want to see, I want to see all the details, make it beautiful, and then maybe they draw themselves like apart from everybody else, right? Is that something you would potentially see? Um, yeah, I mean, a, a kid could definitely do something like that. Um, like if I asked them to maybe, you know, draw me a picture that shows how you feel about school. Um, and then it, that might be something that a kid would draw. Um, and we could explore, you know, I noticed you put yourself over here. Can you tell me about that? That kind of thing. Um, with anxiety, the approach that I typically use is we create a character for their anxiety. And so uh, um, I might say, um, you know, I have a book that I read uh, that I, you know, and I recommend this for parents too. Um, it's called The What If Monster. And it, um, it's basically about this little boy, Jonathan James, and he goes through his day and he has this little what if monster that looks really cute who follows him everywhere. And everywhere he goes, his what if monster is like, but what if, what if this happens or what if that happens? And it's kind of, it, it takes that voice of anxiety in the head and it, in your head and it gives it a shape and a character and a name and a color and it makes it tangible for kids. 
And so then after we read the book, I have them create their own what if monster and name their own what if monster. Um, so some examples are Bob the dragon. Uh, one of my kids last week came up with that one um, or Pete the parrot or different things. And so they'll create their what if monster out of Play-Doh or they'll draw it or I have puppets. They might use a puppet. I let them choose. And then we practice recognizing when our what if monster is talking to us and what they're saying and how we don't have to listen to them and we can talk back to them. We don't have to listen and do exactly what our what if monster is saying. If our what if monster is saying that, um, you know, we need to stay home because it's the only way to be safe. Well, that's not really true, is it? And we can talk about that and talk about how do we stand up to our what if monster. And so that's kind of how I've been addressing anxiety with kids. That's powerful. So, so um, pop culture reference. So on uh, Disney, the, the movie Encanto recently dropped, right? And I've heard, heard a lot of counselors talking about how that's been a, a helpful tool. Have you thought about that at all in your practice? I have, yeah. So there's actually two Disney movies I love to use in my practice. One is Inside Out. We use that when we talk about emotions and, and even in there, you know, um, Riley, the, the child, she goes into like her islands of personality. And so we'll go into that with kids, like, tell me about your islands of personality and all that. But with um, Encanto, yes, we've talked a lot about family dynamics. And so the, the movie, if, if you kind of watch it with a closer look, it's really about the different roles that either we choose to play in our family or that our family puts on us. So for example, maybe, you know, I've had, you know, some child clients really, and actually adults too, even identify with, you know, I feel like Louisa, I feel like I always have to be the strong one in my family. I have a lot of pressure and, you know, that, or I feel like Isabella because I'm expected to be perfect all the time. Or I feel like Mirabelle, I feel like everyone else in my family has these special gifts and things that they're great at. And there's really nothing I feel like I'm good at. Um, and so, yeah, I've used that a lot in working with kids and it's been really helpful. I can see that being helpful for adults and children, really. I mean, mm -hmm. maybe adults aren't as open to talking about Encanto, but I mean, I love the movie. Yeah, some um, of them are actually. Some of good. Them are. Okay, that's good. Um, I did want to ask, so your clients that you said have been lonely, they're home, they're working from home, they're not, they don't have a roommate or anyone there with them. What do you recommend for them? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, I do think that we're getting more to the point where we know more, you know, about COVID, what's safe, what's not safe. Um, you know, more people are starting to spend time together in creative ways, like, you know, hanging out outside, or, um, you know, if they do hang out inside, like wearing higher grade masks or things like that, <laughs> excuse me. I think it's important for um, people to acknowledge the risk of COVID and also the risk of loneliness. Because loneliness, if you look at it, is connected to all sorts of mental and physical health issues down the road. Um, and so, yes, we need, to, we need to avoid getting COVID and, stop the spread and be careful with that, but we also need to be careful with our loneliness. It should also be a priority. And so it's kind of like taking a measured risk. Um, and so, you know, re-engaging in the world in whatever way you can, whether that's spending time with a friend outside, um, you know, meeting a friend, you know, to play games on Zoom or, you know, an online game or something like that um, and pursuing, uh, friendship and community in the same way that we're pursuing safety with COVID because it's a both and situation. Mm -hmm. So higher level question for you, Amy, r related to that. So in terms of first step to becoming emotionally aware with regard to, you know, isolation and loneliness, which I feel like most of us are feeling right in the COVID-19 pandemic, um, what is, what's a good first step or what's a good tool for, for, for me, for instance, if, I'm really missing spending time with people in the local community and seeing friends and we do some things outside and um, but uh, it's, you know, it's very limited. So it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not sufficient, but is there something I should be doing as a daily practice for myself to, to kind of own those emotions rather than just like try and ignore them or suppress them? Because I'm like, I, I, if I can't do anything about it, then I'm just going to ignore those emotions. And then also um, whether you have a spouse, a, uh, partner or, you know, somebody to talk to or not, hopefully you do, um, 
where, where, where does that conversation begin when you're like, okay, I feel something, but I'm not sure what, how to start this conversation. Yeah, that's a great question. So going back to the emotions wheel, this is actually a practice that I do um, that I recommend to many of my clients, but I actually have like a journal that's dedicated specifically to an emotions journal. Um, journaling in general overwhelms me and stresses me out. I, you know, thinking about writing down everything I'm doing that day and all these different things, that's too much for me. Um, if that's your jam, great. Lots of research around journaling as being a very healthy practice, but it's too much. So I had to simplify it. Um, so what I do is I just have a printout of this emotions wheel. Um, I have one on my fridge and I have one by my bed and obviously one in my office. Um, and what I do is I'll take a look at it and I'll just write down each like a, different emotions that I feel like I'm feeling. And then next to each one, I'll write one sentence of why I think I'm feeling that way. Um, and so uh, then, you know, sometimes I do end up sharing that with my husband. Um, and sometimes I just keep it to myself. So he knows that I have this practice and all of that. And so sometimes I'll say like, hey, can I share some stuff with you that I wrote down? Um, and he's like, yeah, of course. And then sometimes I just kind of keep it to myself. It depends on what it is. Um, but becoming aware of it is the reason I say that it's the first step is because um, there's a lot of things that I will do if I'm not aware of my emotions. So for example, um, I may, uh, um, eat. I, this happens, this used to happen to me all the time. I would just like sit on the couch and eat and I would just feel better. Right. Even when I'm not hungry and I know that I'm, I know that I'm not hungry. Um, like that's one thing, or I would, uh, um, constantly pick up my phone if I had any downtime or any silence, almost as a way of like ignoring and not addressing what I'm thinking or how I'm feeling. Like it was uncomfortable to have any kind of downtime at all. So I would have my phone with me and just like pick it up and start scrolling social media, or I would turn on Netflix all the time. And social media and Netflix are fine, right? Like, and eating a bag of chips is totally fine. Like none of those things are wrong, but the way that I was using them, it was like as a way to avoid what I'm feeling versus just acknowledging it um, and then dealing with those emotions. So for example, if I'm feeling, um, you know, I'm gonna say, I'll pick one like, um, you know, speaking of lonely, sometimes we're lonely even within marriage, right? So if I'm feeling lonely because maybe my husband has been working too much or we haven't been able to connect, writing that down and acknowledging it, like, yeah, I feel lonely because I haven't connected with my, with my spouse. And so knowing that, I may then say, hey, we need to have a date night this weekend because I just have not been feeling like we've been connecting versus completely ignoring that emotion and distracting myself with other things. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why being aware of our emotions is so, so important. So I would say that is a great, that's a great first step or a great practical step that you can do. That really is. And I can see where people in marriages definitely fall into that category and then they just don't talk about it. Yeah. And then there's a lot, I'm sure, build up and, you know, until something explodes <laughs> you know I mean it's just I'm sure yeah. I mean it's a very that'd be a very healthy practice well and on that note actually a lot of times we feel anger um and and a little secret about anger anger is actually a secondary emotion almost always there are other feelings underneath anger um and I'll kind of share an example of what I mean by that so if you're watching, you can see, I just shared something called the anger iceberg. And if you're listening, I'll describe it to you. But so basically it's a picture of an iceberg and you can see the iceberg kind of from a cross section. So you can see what's above the water and what's under the water. Um, and it, on the top of the water, the part of the iceberg that's on top says angry. And then underneath the water, we have a whole slew of other emotions that are underneath that. Worried, annoyed, frustrated, anxious, trapped, disappointed, helpless, all these other things. And so usually, almost always when we're angry or when someone else is angry, angry is a surface emotion because it is, it's okay to show anger in our society. It's okay to feel angry in our society, but maybe, and especially if, you know, if you're a man, maybe it's not okay to show that you feel helpless. And so it comes off as anger instead. Or maybe it's not okay to show that you feel lonely. So it comes off as anger instead. Um, 
So when, when you feel angry, when someone else feels angry, I see that as like a little red flag to pay attention to, and then to go deeper. Like, what is it that I might actually be feeling underneath the anger that's driving the anger? This is a great visual. Um, Austin, will we be able to share these or? Absolutely. Yeah, we'll, we'll share it out and we can probably add them to the show notes as well. Some links to okay. these. Yeah. And so, so let's play one out, Amy. So, sure. so say I, I am your patient. I come to your practice and all I know is I'm angry and I have no other emotional awareness. I'm yeah. like, I, I, I'm not sure why, but I express it too much. And I'm, I don't like that. I express it too much, but this is all I know. It's all I've been taught. What, what should I do? What do I go from here? Yeah. Yeah. So we probably do a lot of things. First, um, I would definitely do an extensive intake history because I would imagine that there's, you know, how long have you been feeling angry? When did it first start? Did you feel this way when you were a kid? Um, you know, that sort of stuff and getting kind of a, because likely there are shifts that have happened where the anger started, right? Um, and that would be an important place to pay attention to it in, the, in the client's history because it's, you know, likely connected to that. Um, the other thing is I would kind of give an example too. So, um, and I'll stop sharing the screen, but this is an example I'll use. Like, you know, let's, um, let's say that you, uh, um, you know, are 17 and you, uh, um, go out for the night and you tell your parents, or if this is an adult, I'll say like, you know, that pretend that you're the parent in this situation. Um, and your child is 17 and they go out for the night and you say, okay, be home by 11 o'clock. And they come home or it hits 11 o'clock and they're not home yet. Okay. And then it hits 1130 and they're still not home yet. And you call and you text and you haven't heard anything. And then it hits midnight and they're not home. And then finally at 1am, they come waltzing through the door, like nothing, like it's no big deal. What are you going to do? And they're like, well, I would freak out. I'd yell at them and say like, why didn't you come home? You're grounded, blah, blah, blah. And I would say, yeah. So on the surface, it would look like you were really angry. But what underneath that do you imagine you might be feeling? And then I would pull out this, you know, diagram and they would identify, you know, um, well, actually here, let's try it. So I'll share it. So Austin, if you were the parent in that situation, what emotions do you think you might be feeling? Well, I may actually pass that off to Aaron. Aaron, you, I saw you raise your hand. Do you have an actual example? <laughs> um, worried, uncomfortable, anxious, helpless, more on that. I mean, of course, frustrated, but just more worried. Yeah. More worried than anything. Yeah. And so that concrete example just kind of gives them, you know, some insight into how it works. And so then I would say, all right, so let's pick a recent incident when you, when you felt really angry. Um, tell me about that. And then we would talk about that, you know, talk about the details of it. And then we would use the same thing, like, okay, let's go through, can you pick maybe even one thing that you might, that you might have been feeling other than angry. And then we'll kind of press more into that right? Like, well, you know, maybe I felt worried because, you know, blah, 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 blah. And then I'll say, okay, think back to like feeling worried, you know, was it okay to show in that environment that you were worried? Why or why not? Um, or as a kid, were you allowed to show that you were worried or helpless or those things? And so essentially anger is kind of like a defense mechanism against all these other emotions, right? And so uh, we would kind of explore like, why is it that, you are in this pattern of using the defense mechanism of anger rather than these other using these other emotions or allowing these other emotions to come to the surface. And then slowly we would try to change that relationship with the other emotions and with anger so that the other emotions can come up and express themselves in a healthier way rather than just anger all the time. This is just great, just real life, you know, tools here that we can use. Yeah. And I feel like you said this is the first step. I mean, how many steps are there? I mean, this is a really good one. <laughs> I mean, emotional awareness is the first step, but it's also a huge step. And sometimes this is really, I mean, it's really the gateway to once you, once I can help a client make this step, they can often do a lot of the other stuff on their own. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's wonderful. Austin, did you have anything else? No, this has been amazing. Um, mm -hmm. Amy, thanks so, so much for the explanation on what to, how to, to reach emotional health with just a first step of becoming emotionally aware and so many different tools. And we'll definitely link as much as we can in the show notes, but uh, yeah, it's been, it's been very helpful. 
Thank you so much, Amy. We really appreciate you coming on. Yeah, great. It was a pleasure. Thanks. Thanks. Awesome.